Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll start the webinar shortly as more attendees arrive. Thanks everyone for joining. Let's wait for one more minute to more attendees and then we'll start it. Thank you. Okay, let's start. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are connecting from. My name is Rajkumar Repaswal. I'm part of Citrix Ready technical team, having 11 years of experience in various Citrix technologies. We also have Joseph R. Salajar with us from Ativo Networks. Joseph is a veteran InfoSec professional. He is certified information system security professional, certified ethical hacker, and in case certified examiner with over 25 years of military and civilian experience. He is a retired major from US Army Reserve, having served 22 years in counterintelligence, military intelligence, and cybersecurity. He maintains the CISSP, CEH, and ENCE certifications and currently works as a technical marketing manager for Ativa Networks. All right, I hope everyone is doing good and staying safe. I would like to welcome you all to this Citrix Ready Technical Webinar Series, wherein we showcase how Citrix and our partners have integrated to deliver valuable products and solutions to common problems faced by our customers today. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate your participation here. Next slide, please. Thank you, Joseph. During the webinar, we will talk about the integration of Citrix and Ativo Networks Threat Defense Platform. We'll talk about how Citrix and Ativo Networks together can deliver a very secure environment We'll discuss the various functions of Threat Defend Platform and how it protects the Citrix environment and active directories against various attacks. Please stay with us till the end. We promise we will also have a very interesting and compelling live demo of this. Before we jump on the deeper discussion, I would like to let you know that this webinar is getting recorded and will be made available on Citrix Ready YouTube channel later. Also, there will be a couple of poll questions and sometime I would encourage you to participate actively answering those. We'll also have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar wherein Joseph and I will take up those questions. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat window at any time. Next slide please. Yeah, there is another interesting side of this webinar. We have something for you as a gift for attending the webinar. Every 10th attendee will receive a set of wireless earbuds, though this is only for US reason. We'll let you know how to claim your gift in the end of this webinar. Next slide, please. Okay, just in case, if you are not aware of Citrix Ready program, it is an end-to-end -end technology partner program that helps software, hardware, and services companies to develop and integrate their products with Citrix technologies and also verify their products functionality in Citrix environments. After these products run through a series of test cases scenarios, 
these are approved as citrix ready verified products once verified these validated partner products or solutions are listed in citrix ready marketplace citrix ready marketplace is an online resource that customer can use to easily search and find compatible solutions for their citrix deployments or environment partner can then participate in joint marketing activities to drive awareness and generate demand for the solutions currently there are 6000 plus verified partner products listed on our marketplace partners can also showcase their offerings to over 400000 customers and 10000 resellers by listing their profile and solutions in citrix ready marketplace for more information on citrix ready market program you can navigate to citrix.com slash partner programs slash citrix ready or you could reach us at citrix ready at citrix.com next slide please yep so be it on on-prem version or the service on citrix cloud citrix virtual apps and desktop which previously known as zenapp and gen desktop is the central component of citrix workspace it empowers how employees work and empowers businesses to expand in the new ways citrix workspace allows multiple users to remotely access and operate their applications and desktops running in a data center or public or private cloud where devices located elsewhere this empowers to access your resources applications securely from any device or low cost endpoints BYODs from anywhere so this also eliminates the challenges faced by IT team in managing servers data centers patching the operating systems PC management which allows more time to focus on other initiatives to talk about Citrix virtual apps and desktop service on cloud the management or control for a customer deployment is provisioned and managed by citrix itself on citrix cloud customers don't have to handle the core product installation setup configuration upgrades monitoring or scaling of the management side as that is all left to citrix to handle and keep evergreen and secure to know more about citrix cloud please explore our citrix cloud services and get a feel of how easy it is to use these services by navigating to citrix.cloud.com or cloud.citrix.com with this i will launch a couple of poll questions i'll encourage you to answer those and then we'll start with the next slides yeah so we will wait for 30 seconds i encourage you to answer Thank you. Do we have another poll questions? Please take your time and answer this one as well. Okay, with this, please welcome Joseph to explain more about Ativo Networks and the various function of Threat Defense Platform. Over to you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raj. So, um, my name is Joseph Salazar. As uh, Raj said, I am a technical marketing manager for Ativo Networks. Now, Ativo Networks may be unfamiliar to a few of you, but uh, we do have a very long uh, history already, um, in the sense that a startup can have a very long history. We have over uh, we have a lot of customer traction, over 350 customers globally. We have half of the Fortune 10 as customers. However, 65% of our customers have less than 5,000 employees, showing that we can scale from mid-sized enterprises all the way up to the biggest organizations. Um, in the past three years, we've been on the Deloitte Pass 500, which rep and that uh, time period shows about a 724% growth over that evaluated period. So we are growing very well. We've won over 130 awards and counting. Um, we're actually, I think, just received a few more that we haven't um, publicized yet. Um, we are well-funded um, through our C round, but we've been profitable for the past several quarters, meaning that that as a startup, um, you know, we started shipping product in 2014. Um, in 
uh, six, seven years, we've actually been very good about how we're using the money that we've uh, raised. And we're actually making money, adding it back to the account so that we are w sustaining our growth. Now, the company's mission is to provide credential protection and controlled access management to deny, detect, and derail attacks moving laterally as efficiently and accurately as possible. Now, I said a few things in there that, that should, should indicate that we do in-network threat detection. We are not a perimeter solution. So a typical advanced attack looks like this. At the initial recon, all of this happens before the attacker is directly engaged with an organization. So they're going to gather intel, they're going to use open source information, um, they're going to figure out who they're going to target and how they're going to approach. And then afterwards, they're going to conduct the activities to do the initial compromise, which is usually through social engineering, like a phishing email or something like that, to exploit a vulnerability, install malware, and get access to that very first system. Now that beachhead is where, going to, where they're going to expand and launch the rest of their attacks. It's their land and expand opportunity. So they're going to establish persistence and remote access. They're going to get, get communications with their, with their C2 servers or command and control. And then they go into what's called the persistence cycle. They're going to establish persistence locally on that endpoint. They're going to look for passwords. They're going to look for privileged accounts. They're going to crack your stored hashes. They're going to gather any local data and maybe exploit it if they can. And then they're going to conduct reconnaissance. They're going to look for stored credentials. I mean, they're going to identify the next targets in the chain. They're, and most attackers don't scan the network anymore. There's plenty of information in Active Directory and locally on the system. Um, or they can do something as simple as checking the IP address of the system they're on and then going up and down that list until they can find another target to attack. And then once they do that, they're going to move to those targets. And they're going to do the exact same things that they did in the initial infection. They're going to exploit, they're going to establish a connection, exploit vulnerabilities, install malware, gain access, and then they're going to install the persistence mechanism. They're going to do the back doors, they're going to establish a command and control, et cetera. And this cycle continues as they burrow deeper into the network. And while they're doing that, they're looking for targets to exploit, not just systems, but data and other critical infrastructure that they can use as part of their attack. And then eventually, they're going to find those high value targets, and then they're going to execute on those high value targets. They're going to exploit data, maybe destroy it, cover the tracks by deleting logs, and then they're going to disengage. Now, stopping this type of an attack, stopping this attack cycle requires interrupting the attacker before they can progress to the last phase. And the earlier you stop that attack, the less damage can occur. So Ativo created a threat defense platform to detect lateral movement activities that attackers would execute once they've established their um, beachhead, but before they can break out. So, a lot of, of what we do now is, is designed to, to use several components in the portfolio to, to establish a layered set of defenses. So the very bottom, AD Secure, is for those who only want a standalone Active Directory solution. Now, everybody knows that attackers go after an uh, Active Directory. I'll actually detail a technique that they use uh, later on that shows an attack cycle that specifically targets Active Directory information. Now, the AD Secure solution protects Active Directory from unauthorized queries at the endpoint without touching the production domain controllers, which is kind of important because a lot of domain admins don't want you messing with their servers. Now, above that is the EDN solution, which includes the AD Secure solution because the AD Secure solution is, alone as a stand, is available as a standalone or part of the endpoint detection net, which or EDN. Now, the EDN solution adds several functions to protect the endpoint, which I'll discuss and demonstrate in a few minutes. Now, these are things like fake hidden map shares, decoy credentials, traffic redirection for illicit reconnaissance or connection attempts, and just queries to Active Directory as covered in AD Secure. And then above that is the bot sync, which is a server that adds network decoys, analysis, forensic collection, uh, integrations, and uh, centralized management. Now, these solutions all build on each other to create an overlapping detection fabric across the entire organization whether on-premises, in the cloud, or at remote work sites. So anywhere the enterprise exists, the uh, Ativo solutions can defend it. Now, 
Organizations rely on prevention controls already. We already know this. They have prevention controls. But since most attacks occur from the endpoint, they rely on EDR and EPP solutions to like, you know, the ones listed below as their first line of defense. However, attackers have proven that they can evade these security controls to compromise that initial beachhead. Now, Ativo offers the EDM solution that augments any endpoint security controls to improve detection efficiency by an average of 42%. Now, we've proven this via the MITRE ATT&CK do-it-yourself evaluations using several scoring methodologies. Now, the point, though, is that the solution does not compete with the EDR and EPP solutions that are already in place. Instead, it complements and it augments them with post-compromise lateral movement detection. So EDR is designed to prevent them from breaking in in the first place, and EDR and EPP do a very good job of this. But for those attacks that bypass these, these or evade these defenses and manage to compromise the network that in, in that initial inf initially infected system, they still have to move around. And that's where we can detect them as they attempt to break out and spread across the network. So now you're getting a much better detection efficiency, much deeper in the attack cycle. Now, the Threat Defend platform fits as the next internal layer beyond the prevention controls already in place. It performs in-network threat detection for the following at, at lateral movement activities, discovery, credential theft, actual lateral movement, privilege escalation, and data collection or exploit attempts. Now, we've looked, at, and actually based on our mapping, we will detect 11 of 12 categories in the MITRE ATT&CK framework but our, our specialty and our emphasis is in the middle parts of the attack cycle, which is the lateral movement, credential theft, privilege escalation, and data collection, data exploitation. Now, the threat perfect, we've analyzed what attackers do at the endpoint, and we've identified specific activities that evade detection from those existing security controls, but are lateral movement activities that are common to many attacks. Now, the point of our detection is that the mere act of the attacker looking for something triggers that detection. Now, these activities are listed below. So you've got Active Directory Recon, where they steal Active Directory objects. You, they will conduct man-in-the-middle attacks, where they'll steal in-transit credentials. They're going to access local credentials, so those, they're going to steal whatever is already stored on, the, on that endpoint that they've landed on. Then exploit services by looking for active ports and services that they can exploit. They're going to discover network assets by looking for, say, um, other services that are available. They're going to compromise map network shares. So they're going to spread via SMB or, or SIF shares or any kind of file servers. And they're going to move laterally by looking at what's stored on that endpoint and using the credentials to target the destinations of those credentials. So, if I, for example, if I store an RDP connection to a server and an attacker gets onto my system, they can steal that RDP credential and get access to that server. Now, EDN provides early detection of all of these attempts. It'll provide forensics and visibility. And because of the integrations that, that the platform has with existing solutions, you can accelerate your incident response. So the Threat Defend platform addresses these and other attack activities using several techniques that do not impact regular production. So first is that they will provide attack path visibility to understand credentials and endpoint exposures. Right? These, these things are, that are already exist on the network are what we call threat paths. And then they're going to, then we're going to use um, concealment to hide and deny access to local files, folders, accounts, and storage. So the attackers can't see the real, uh, the real uh, objects and data that they're going to target. And then we're going to obfuscate the attack surface with network decoys of all types, such as Active Directory controllers, web servers, or even Citrix servers. Now, these decoys differ from other similar solutions. They're full operating system VM decoys, meaning that you can customize them to look exactly like your production systems. So the attacker can't tell the difference between the fake and the real ones. Now, the system uses mechanism machine learning to craft decoys automatically for each VLAN in as little as one hour. So once, once we've crafted these decoys, not just at the network, not just systems at the network, but actual credentials and things and, and other artifacts at the endpoint, then you just have to deploy them. And then additionally, you can customize them in any way you want, even importing production images to become decoys. So let's talk about these functions and then see a demo of how all the endpoint pieces work. So on any system the attacker lands on, 
They're going to look for any local files or accounts that they, that they can use to progress their attack, such as a ransomware attack. The EDM data cloak function hides and restricts access to sensitive or critical files, folders, local administrator accounts, network or cloud map shares, and removable storage. It identifies and generates alerts for any attempts to access these protected assets and captures the unauthorized commands and processes that spawned them. By limiting what the attacker sees and alerting when they look, defenders can disrupt their activities early during the reconnaissance phase. Now, attackers will conduct port and service scans from the beachhead system to host to the ho any host that they identify, looking for available services, and then check to see if they can exploit these services through vulnerabilities or misconfigurations. Uh, because they're interrogating numerous ports from several hundred all the way to the full 65,000 plus, they will hit closed ports that don't have any running services. Now, the EDN's deflect function redirects any connection attempts, even ICMP ping, touching these closed ports to the black hole port, to a black hole port or a decoy with a corresponding open port and service. Now, this deflection does two things. It prevents accurate fingerprinting because even closed ports will respond, and it redirects the attacks away from the production assets, further disrupting the attack. Now, to illustrate, on an, inbound, on an inbound connection, say an attacker is attacking a system with a protection on it. They're going to try to connect on, SA, on HTTP and SSH. Now, the target only has SSH running, and so it's going to allow that connection because existing services will operate and will not be interrupted by this function. But because it's not running a web server, HTTP, it's going to redirect that connection attempt on port 80 to a decoy web server on, um, on the bot sync or to a black hole IP address. Now, the same happens on the outbound. If, you, if the attacker is operating from a protected system and attempts to go outbound to an unprotected system, you're going to get the same effect. An SSH connection will touch an SSH port and go through, but an HTTP connection, which, uh, which hits a closed port, it's going to go to the decoy. And then an interesting thing about this function is that we can actually use this for native isolation. So we can tunnel both inbound and outbound traffic from an infected system to the decoy environment, so all they can connect to are decoys. Hey, Joseph, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Can you hide your control? Uh, it actually shows in the right side, yeah. Oh, there we it go. Actually... Sorry, I apologize. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, now, attackers will carry Active Directory to collect information to use in their attacks. Now, any domain joint system can query Active Directory, and no current security controls can identify any illicit queries from a legitimate one, except for the AD Secure solution. So regular users do not query Active Directory as part of the regular jobs. And privileged users that do so and are part, are part of a specific security group that authorizes such queries. So what the AD Secure Solution does is it looks for unauthorized AD queries, whether either the user or the process is not part of a pre-configured ACL or access control list. So it detects these illicit inbound queries and hides any sensitive or critical accounts and objects within the results, instead inserting decoy accounts and objects in their place. Now, the best part is that this all happens at the endpoint and the solution does not affect the production AD controllers in any way. Again, these can point to a black hole IP address or to a decoy for engagement. And I'll show that in action during the demo. So the graphic below is an example of how an attacker can compromise Active Directory to further their attacks. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to gain an initial foothold. Again, typically this is a phishing email. Then they're going to conduct reconnaissance and, rec and, and discovery attempts. They're going to look for privileged accounts. They're going to look for net sessions to high value targets. They're going to look for paths to high privileged users like admins or you know, act, um, taking advantage of what's listed in, in access control lists. Then they're going to move laterally to a domain PC that an administrator is logged into. They're going to use commonly uh, common local admin passwords or hashes or any even maybe stored credentials that they've stolen from somebody else. They're going to steal admin credentials from that admin PC, whether it's a saved credential, an RDP session, a SIF share, or something that gives them admin level control. And then they're going to go to the, uh, the create persistence on the Active Directory. They're going to go to the Active Directory, use their elevated permissions to create additional domain accounts or elevate other accounts to domain administrative privileges. And then finally, they're going to target the high value targets, whether it's a database, file server, even your executives, and then they're going to conduct their attacks on those systems. Now, here's the interesting part about this, and I, know, I, I don't know if you guys picked up on this. 
If you disrupt the attack when they're conducting reconnaissance and discovery, everything else downstream gets disrupted as well. If the attackers aren't working with accurate information, you as a defender have the advantage. Now, attackers will typically look for any locally stored credentials to steal and reuse because it gives them immediate access to a system or a service with a legitimate username and password. Now, the threat path solution creates a graphical map of all such stored credentials and misconfigurations that the attacker can take advantage of and show these as connection links or paths between the systems and the accounts. It can then automatically remediate some of these exposures and flag the rest for the security teams to address. Now, this function reduces the attack surface by reducing the open paths between the systems on the initial assessment and then monitors the environment for new exposures that arise. So let's put this all together. So this graphic depicts a typical Citrix environment with a persistence Zen BDI images, applications and DDD servers, DDC servers, and application and desktop services. Now, the Ativo solution protects the environment in several ways. The first thing you can do is you can create decoy servers, including Citrix infrastructure servers, and that can engage with the attacker. So as an attacker is looking for targets we will show up as additional targets within the VLAN that normal users wouldn't see, but the attackers would as part of their discovery activity. Then the second thing that you can do is you can install the EDN solution on the persistent uh, VDI images and every production system with decoy credentials and other uh, endpoint artifacts that point to the decoy environment for engagement. All the EDN functions will work. So for example, if an attacker lands on a Zen persistent VDI image, and attempts to conduct Active Directory queries or a ransomware attack or anything else, all of the EDN detections and solution, prevention solutions will kick in and prevent that or detect it as it happens. So remember how I mentioned ransomware attacks earlier? Now, TiVo actually has a unique solution for ransomware attacks that doesn't look to prevent the attack because we know that attackers will always find a way to get a malicious binary onto an endpoint. Instead, what it looks for is it tries to stall the attack and it slow it down so the defenders can actually respond before the ransomware does a lot of damage. So let me explain how that works. When the ransomware infects a system, it's going to look for local folders to encrypt before moving on to the network shares. Now, the EDN solution addresses these actions with decoy credentials, hidden fake map shares, and that data cloak function that I mentioned to hide these local files and folders so the ransomware only sees the decoy file shares, the decoy folders, and the decoy credentials. Now, when the ransomware attempts to spread, it's going to see only those decoy file shares, so it's going to try to encrypt those decoy file shares. And as it does that, the solution will actually rate limit the connection, so it slows it down significantly, and then it starts feeding the ransomware unlimited data. Think of it as piping dev random to the ransomware encryption process. So it, what it effectively does then is it stalls the attack because the ransomware is just going to keep encrypting the fake data so it never completes its encryption. And then it also generates an alert so that the security team knows that there's a ransomware attack happening and then it can respond to it quickly. Now, this may be sufficient for traditional ransomware attacks. But what about ransomware 2.0? Well, remember that ransomware 2.0 conducts lateral movement activities similar to what an advanced attacker will do. So the solution, the ATIVA solution already addresses these. So that means that it will effectively derail ransomware 2.0 attacks as well. As the ransomware attacker tries to move laterally using many of the te techniques that we've listed, looking for those high value assets that they can encrypt and demand a higher ransom for, such as your AD controller, a, a production database of some sort, or even other critical infrastructure, the Ativo solution will detect, and in some cases, deflect that activity so that the attacker doesn't get a chance to actually target the high value targets within your network. So here's an example of a recent ransomware 2.0 attack that il illustrates how quickly it can happen. Now, this is a case study that was released by the DIFFA report very recently, I might add, as you can see. Um, the initial access came from a phishing email 
containing links to a Google Drive that downloaded uh, the it's a, a downloader uh, uh, called Bazaar. Now the Bazaar loader backdoor um, loaded um, at the executable loaded when they when the uh, users clicked on the link. Now the time from the initial Bazaar execution to domain reconnaissance was five minutes. And then they deployed what are called Cobalt Strike beacons uh, within the next 10 minutes. Now, Cobalt Strike is a commercial penetration testing tool that someone managed to pull the, some of the, the information, like the, the Cobalt Strike beacons, which will phone home to a command and control server and can um, can do reverse connection attempt, can, can do reverse connections from that command control server back to the beacon system. Now that deployment happened within 10 minutes. Now, after bringing in Cobalt Strike, the attackers used a third-party application called AdFind or ADFind, which is an AD query tool to continue domain discovery activity. Now, in this case, they deployed persistence mechanisms on the beachhead host. Now, after establishing another command and control connection for an additional Cobalt Strike beacon, they employed the zero logon exploit, which is CVE 2020-1472, and obtained domain admin level credentials. Now they then used host process, process injection on the beachhead to, for obfuscation and privilege escalation. Now with the domain administrator privileges, they, the threat actors then moved laterally through the network using SMB uh, connections and RDP to deploy Cobalt Strike beacons on the domain controllers in about an hour after the initial ex execution of the bizarre loader. Now on the domain controllers, uh, they did some additional discovery using PowerShell Active Directory modules. So they were doing queries against that Active Directory to look for additional information. And then from there, they targeted other servers within the environment, specifically backup systems, file servers, and software deployment servers. Now, backup systems is easy to understand. They want to delete backups and even encrypt the backups so that you're forced to pay a greater ransom. File servers for the for the same obvious reason they want to uh, to encrypt that data so you're forced to pay a ransom. But why software deployment servers? That one's a little bit harder to think a little harder, but makes perfect sense once you think about it. They use the software de deployment servers to deploy their malware. So they use the software deployment servers to actually deploy additional Cobalt Strike beacons and additional malware infections using existing software delivery mechanisms. And then after they've established the Cobalt Strike beacons and all those, they then proceeded their final objective. At two hours, the threat actors made the move to deploy the Ryuk ransomware by establishing RDB connections from the domain controllers to all of those servers. Now this continued for the next hour until the entire, entire domain had been encrypted. And with that, work completing in just three hours after the first bizarre loader was executed. Now here's the interesting thing about all this. All of these highlighted activities, noteworthy tactics, privilege escalation, credential access, discovery of both the domain and Active Directory objects, and lateral movement, all are detected by the Threat Defend platform. So let us see this in action. I'm going to switch over to two systems. Now these systems are part of the same Active Directory. They are configured exactly the same way. The only difference is the system on the right with the teal background is protected. The system on the left is not. Now, I've scripted a few um, attack commands that are pretty common to uh, a lot of these Active Directory attacks. Now, here's the key. These are all built in to the operating system right now. I haven't loaded any new software. So all of these things would be on present on every single Windows system. And as you see, all I'm doing is running the commands. There's no scripted responses. So let's go ahead and run these commands on both systems. Now, the, D, the NL test um, uh, application has a bunch of flags that will allow me to extract information from Active Directory. The first one is the, D, the slash DC list. Now, the slash DC, DC list lists all the domain controllers that are in the environment. And as you see here, there are five domain controllers in the actual production Active Directory environment. But when I check with the protected system, I only get two. I'll tell you right now that these two are decoys. Now, the DS get DC list tells me which one I'm actually connected to. Now, for consistency, I should be connected to the primary domain controller, which is ADSE demo. In this case, on the protected system, I am. 
on the unprotected system, it tells me that I'm connected to the PDC Mar Win Server 2. Now, one of the things I'll, that I will do as an attacker is enumerate the domain administrator group because this gives me targets that I target accounts that I can go after. So in this case, I've enumerated a bunch of domain admins on the production system. Now, I should get the same information on the protected system because it's part of the same Active Directory, but I do not. Now, clearly, Brad Pitt, Johnny Depp, and Tom Cruise do not work for our organization. But you see here that the type of information is similar, but what we're doing is we're hiding the real information and putting fake data in its place. Now, all of this fake data is completely configurable. Now, so let's check one of these users to make sure that it, it's actually live. Notice here that Amy Gully, this user, last changed their password last year, but they last logged in today um, at, um, uh, at 3 a.m. Zulu time, because all of our times are in Zulu. Notice also that the local group and memberships are part of domain admins group, the domain user group, and IT level two. So let's look at Brad Pitt, see what kind of uh, per, um, permissions he has. Well, he also logged in. He last logged in about a week ago. Notice the group memberships. He's only he's part of domain admins and domain users. So it's similar information, but not a duplicate. So it's the information that an attacker would seize, but it's not inf duplicate information. So the attacker couldn't suspect that something was going wrong. Now the set SPN. For those of you who aren't familiar, set SPN stands for set service principal names. Now, service principal names are a function within Active Directory that allows a, a, a server of some sort to authenticate with a service account. And to do that, you must register the SPN with Active Directory. So the set SPN, SPN command does this, but it also has a query function, which is the dash Q. So what this command does is this command is going to query um, the Active Directory for any HTTPS servers, because the way I figure as an attacker, anything that's showing HTTPS as a secure web server is probably going to have some interesting or critical information on it. So in this case, you notice I have five servers approximately. I have two code repos, I have a CRM servers, and then I have a web server. Now, if I run that same command on the protected system, I get one, and that is Win Server, uh, Win Server One, Mar Win Server One, which we also know is a decoy. Now, just to prove that this and the um, domain controller are live systems, I'm actually going to ping them, and you notice I'm getting a response from Mar Win Server One. So, as an attacker, if I tried to connect and exploit this system, I could. If I, as an attacker, tried to connect to the Active Directory controller to run some sort of exploit, in this case, Mar Win Server Two. I would be able to connect to it because again, these are live decoys in the environment. Now the Klist command is another really good command to learn as an attacker. The Klist command lists Kerberos tickets. It's a way for you to not only identify actual Kerberos ticket granting ticket servers, but production domain controllers as well. And this is a, usually a precursor to a Kerberos thing attack or a golden ticket or silver ticket attack. So in this case, this tells me that I've got five cached tickets. Here's the Kerberos ticket granting ticket. Notice it's SE demo local. Notice that our primary server is LDAP AD SE demo. So this tells me that the KDC that I called is AD SE demo local, which is as expected because that is the primary domain controller. So if I run that exact same command in the protected system, I also get five stored cache tickets, but notice the server that it's pointing to is mar winserve2. So it is consistently pointing to our decoy domain controller. And again, all this is happening without touching the production active directory at all. Now, additionally, as an attacker, I'm going to look for local administrators. Now, the, lo the net local group administrators will list all of the, the um, local administrator group members in this system. So I'm going to show you who is a domain administrator on this, or a, a local administrator on the system, by pulling up the snap-in. Now, this snap-in should, should match everything that I have in the domain administrator group. So the administrator group is showing five users. Now, remember, as an attacker, I don't have access to that graphical user interface. Chances are I've got remote shell, and I'm doing PS, PS exec and catting some of the information back to my terminal. So if I run this command, it's going to be going through a command line. So if I run this local, that local group administrators, I should get the same information. 
but I'm only going to see the command line. So notice, I'm getting the exact same information. So let's look at the protected system. I'm going to look at the snap-in. And again, this snap-in is available to anybody as a regular user. And let's look to see who belongs to the local group administrators. So notice here, I have six. There's an extra one, decoy admin. But if I run that same command, I only show two. What this has hidden, done is it's hidden administrators, Chandan, demo user, and uh, SE demo uh, Joseph. It's showing the decoy administrator and the uh, SE demo domain admins. So this is an example of data cloak in action. We are hiding local files and folders, local accounts, I'm sorry. Now, the net use command. I use this command uh, as part of a ransomware attack because I'm going to, what NetUse does is it enumerates all mapped shares on the network, on this endpoint. Notice here that I have an X drive, which matches right here because here's my X drive. Now notice here, when I run the exact same command, notice I also have an X drive, but when I run this command, I show a W and a Z drive. And notice that they point to the decoy servers. These are the decoy network file shares that we use to, to derail ransomware attacks. Now, another interesting thing then is, is the deflect function, which I talked about in a, a little while ago. Whoops. Dash an. So what the netstat um, command does is it lists all listening ports, all open listening ports on the systems. Notice that these are the typical Windows ports and then a bunch of typical Windows high ports. What's missing from there? What's missing from there is web servers or SSH. So if I were to try to connect to that system, now this system is 5.23, 192.168.5.23. I should get a bounce message. I should say, it should say that I can't connect. But in this case, I actually connect to a Swift terminal which is a decoy Swift terminal that's built into our product. Now, that's on an inbound connection. What about an outbound connection? So what if I try to connect? Now, Kitty is just a, another version of Putty. It's a fourth version of Putty. What if I try to connect to our unprotected system, which is 5.130? I should not have gotten this prompt because there is no port 22 open running SSH. So if I were to type to log in as say Brad Pitt. Let's see if I fat fingered the password. I did fat finger the password, but I should not have gotten this, this prompt in the first place. So, so as you see, the deflect function works both inbound and outbound. Now, let's look at the hidden, the, the hiding and denying access, right? Because because the that's another thing that an attacker will do. So um, Let's go to the user's directory, and then let's go into the user uh, that's logged in, right? Because this is who, who am I? I am logged in as user X. So I am in the user X folder. So let's go into the same user directory in the user X folder. Here's the user X folder. Okay, so if I were to do a directory enumeration here, I should see the same things that I see here. What don't I see? I don't see the hide me folder. Now, the hide me folder, is a folder that we configured so that an, uh, as, as a hidden, hidden folder so that the attacker can't see um, anything that's inside it. Now, inside that folder is actually a bunch of different folders, a, 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 a file called test.exe. And I know that this is real because I've written to it, I can modify it and I can save it and everything works. Now, if I try to CD to the hide me folder as an attacker, I can't see it. What if I tried to delete it? Can't do that. Okay, fine. As an attacker, I'm like, okay, not a big deal. Let's see what's in the documents folder. Because I know there are things in the documents folder. So if I go to the documents folder here, in the GUI, you notice that there are six accounts here. I mean, there are six files here. But if I enumerate this directory, I only see two. The reason why I only see two is we hid all of the office type documents, PDFs, doc, uh, Word documents, Excel spreadsheet, and PowerPoints. 
So what if I what if I I know through some other ways that 4.1 update PDF is here? So what if I try to open or delete uh, 4.1.pdf? So let's try to delete that. Can't find it. So but I can see Palo Alto. Uh, dot text. I can go into Palo Alto dot text. I can open the threat strike PNG, but I can't access anything else that's actually important. So that illustrates how the endpoint solution conducts deflection. It uses the data clock function and it hides and denies access using that data clock function and it hides the um, and protects Active Directory from unauthorized queries. Okay, let's go back to um, the uh, slide deck, and I believe that is my last slide that leaves us with uh, a few minutes for any questions. Um, Raj? Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, that was a great live demo. Yeah, we have some questions. The first question is the Ativo solution puts these decoy services and systems all over the network. So how do you avoid false positives? So that's a good question. Um, the point of the decoy environment that it, is that it is hidden from regular production, right? So so our user doing their, no, their, their normal um, activities shouldn't run into any of the decoy systems because they know which production servers are which. They know the file servers that they go to, they know the web servers that they go to, all of those are part of the regular job. But an attacker that is on the network is essentially playing blind man's bluff. They have to do reconnaissance and discovery to find production systems. So as they're doing that discovery, they're touching systems with no production value. And that's how we make that detection. Anything that touches a decoy, is automatically suspicious. So that's how we avoid that that false positive. Because a regular user will be will, won't be touching that unless they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing, like an insider threat, looking for data they're not supposed to, or looking for other servers, or or doing something they're not supposed to do. So that's how we avoid those those um, false positives. Regular users will never see them. They're never going to see the fake credentials that are stored on their endpoints. They're never going to run queries against Active Directory from PowerShell. Right, so so regular users would never touch our our our, this, our um, detection fabric. Yeah, and the another question I have is, what do you do for cloud? So that that's a good question, um, and I know it's a, it's on a lot of people's minds because the um, because of the current situation with with everyone remote working remotely and the important and the sudden importance of being able to access data and services remotely. So cloud's actually very interesting. We do quite a few things for cloud because a lot of what I talked about seems like it's only on premises. But remember that cloud credentials get stored on endpoints as well. So the first thing we'll do is we'll actually protect cloud credentials by creating fake credentials that point to your cloud assets. The second thing we can do is we can deploy decoys within the cloud infrastructure itself. Right, so these decoy credentials that are for your cloud assets are pointing to decoy cloud assets. And then when we create decoy cloud assets, we don't just create decoy systems. We can do things for native cloud technology, such as serverless functions, containers, storage buckets. We can even monitor for high uh, risk or high use accounts using integrations with some with the major cloud providers. And then we are soon going to be um, uh, deploying uh, functions that will handle identity within the cloud from a threat detection perspective as well. So there's a lot of things we do with cloud. We can deploy to any uh, major cloud provider, all of the major cloud providers, even some of the not so major cloud providers like Oracle Cloud, or um, uh, you know, so we can handle AWS, Azure. Um, Google Cloud Platform. We can even do our AD protections for AD in the cloud. So if you configure AD and you put it up in, say, Azure, and you've got AD infrastructure within Azure, we can protect against queries that touch those. So there's a lot of things we do in the cloud. And, and even whether it is public, public, private, or a hybrid deployment, we can protect cloud environments as well. Awesome. 
thanks for answering that one yeah there's one question i'm getting repetitively is about the recording of the webinar the question is are we going to send the link of this recorded webinar so i'll answer this yes we have a process every attendee we will be sending the link of the webinar once i mean you'll, you'll get a link of the webinar whoever attends it Those are the questions, yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned in the starting of webinar about the gift, we will notify every 10th attendee to claim a pair of wireless earbuds, though this is only for US reason. Please look out for an email from us with instructions to claim your gift. Yeah, with this, I'd like to say thank you, Joseph, for your time to showcase the various function of three different platform and the live demo as well. I, I, I'm sure that this will definitely benefit to customers or individual ones who would like to use our joint solution. And to the all attendees, I would like to thank everyone of you for taking your valuable time out for attending this webinar. Really appreciate your participation here and I wish you have a great day ahead. Thank you. With this, we conclude the webinar. Do you have anything to say, Joseph? No, it was just thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And um, again, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to um, uh, either uh, Ativo or Citrix. And everyone have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye.